Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to start by playing a video from President DeRoche. Good morning and welcome. I am Rice University President Reginald DeRoche. Although I'm not able to be here with you today in person, my excitement about this year's DeLang Conference is the same as if I were. The DeLang Conferences have always explored matters of great importance and have provided people with the knowledge and tools to move forward to tackle such issues in powerful and effective ways. The focus of this year's conference is the exploration of dynamic interactions between technology, society, and culture, and how society should respond to the unexpected impacts of technological change. More specifically, the conference will address the challenges of information technology, health and medicine, and climate change. It will also explore how to create a more just and equitable society. Over the next couple of days, you will hear from a diverse group of experts on these topics from across Rice's campus. The conference sessions will be held here at the BRC, the Bioscience Research Collaborative, and at the ION, two locations known for great research and innovation. What you will learn and experience is due in large part to the generosity of CM and Damaris Huspis. The couple established an endowment at Rice in memory of Damaris's parents, Albert and Damaris Delane. The endowment has supported the Delane conferences for more than two decades. The DeLang conferences are held every other year and range broadly in subject matter and discipline. All are intended to bring Rice's top experts and major figures to focus on a topic of great concern to society. Some past conferences have focused on humans, machines and the future of work, sustainable development, teaching in the University of Tomorrow, and the future of research university in a global age. All are important topics. The knowledge gained at the conferences is used to solve some of the world's greatest challenges, which is what Rice is all about. I also want to thank our speakers for sharing their knowledge. With it, we will be better equipped to find solutions and make important discoveries. And lastly, I want to thank the members of the steering committee, especially Moshe Barty, the conference chair, for all their time and effort in putting this conference together. Enjoy your time on Rice's campus and the knowledge you will gain from this conference. I look forward to hearing about the ideas that follow. Thank you to President DeRoche for those wonderful opening remarks. And on behalf of Sciencio, welcome to the 12th DeLand Conference. We're honored that you're with us. In 1980, uh, two Rice professors both wanted to borrow Kepler's collected works from the university library, and unfortunately for them, the library only owned one copy. So when the professors requested a library carol to share the volumes, they probably didn't expect that the administration would give them seed funding to start their own institute, but that's how Sciencia was born. In the 43 years since, it has evolved from a generous way to solve a faculty dispute into the most visible platform for Rice faculty and distinguished guests to publicly present their work on campus. As President DeRoche mentioned, a few years after Sciencia's founding, Rice alumni Hank and Damaris Hudspeth established endowments for both Sciencia itself and the DeLang Conference. Damaris passed away in 2015, and Hank passed away in 2019 at the age of 100. They were both deeply devoted to Ciencia, and all of us in Ciencia are exceptionally grateful to the Hudspeth family for their lasting legacies. I'd like to offer my thanks to a host of people who made this year's conference possible, the membership of Ciencia and previous director Rick Wilson, the DeLang Conference Steering Committee, Zachary Ball, Margaret Beyer, Rodrigo Ferreira, Fred Higgs, Diana Strassman, and Devika Subramaniam, our events coordinators, Ann Dick and Adriana Small, who have handled all of the logistics so expertly, Jan Odegaard and the staff at the ION for hosting us tonight, our terrific lineup of speakers, and a very special thanks to conference chair Moisha Vardy. Because of the pandemic, Moisha had to reschedule to the Lang multiple times. He has really gone above and beyond to bring us all together. And finally, a big thank you to all of us I'm sorry to all of you for joining us. <laughs> I was close. 
Um, Charles Dickens' famous opening line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, is a fitting moniker for today's world. Figures like Steven Pinker have argued that humans are better off today than at any time in world history, pointing to increased life expectancy, reduced poverty, improving human rights, and lower levels of violence worldwide. And yet it is hard not to feel like we are living under Damocles' sword as the world confronts some nearly unsurmountable challenges. More and more technology is at the center of the enormous trade-offs facing humankind, both advancing our well-being, often in astonishing ways, and yet also sometimes threatening it. That is the vital and timely subject of this year's conference. Certainly, no matter how hopeful one feels about human progress, it's hard to escape the fact that we need to do better. The benefits are too often unevenly distributed, and they're becoming increasingly precarious. Researchers and scholars have key roles to play in charting the most promising paths forward, not just discovering new tools and solutions, but also shining a light on developments outside of the public eye and crucially getting the facts straight, without which it's impossible to make sound decisions. This year's Ciencia's lecture series theme is betterment of the world, a phrase incorporated in Rice's mission statement. Ultimately, the hope and drive to better the world is what has brought us all here together for the next two days. I know we'll all be looking forward to talks by our distinguished speakers and the thought-provoking discussions that follow. Rice's policy encourages you to wear a mask whenever you feel it is appropriate. Please do not feel any hesitation to do so during the conference. Conference Director Moshe Vardy, University Professor and Karen Ostrom, George Distinguished Service Professor in Computational Engineering, was planning to introduce our first session. Unfortunately, his wife required surgery this weekend after a fall and he had to be at the hospital this morning. Thankfully, she's doing well and he hopes to join us in the afternoon. So I'm going to just um, share with you a slide, a uh, couple of slides Moshe wanted me to share. So here is our first session, and uh, this is a, a slide uh, Moshe asked me to share. Alison Stranger writing in 2022, there is growing public awareness that the velocity of technological innovation has outstripped the West's effort to harness it to the common good. An unprecedented shift in the balance of power between multinational industry and national governments has been a necessary condition for these new challenges. How else could a freely elected American president be silenced by Google, Twitter, and Facebook? How else could Facebook's Instagram be exposed as knowingly causing harm to teenagers without government penalty? Our first session this morning oops, uh, will include uh, talks by Fred Oswald, Elizabeth Petrick, and William Fulton. Uh, each speaker will speak for about 40 minutes and we'll have uh, five minutes for questions from the audience. And if you do have a question, if we can encourage you, please, to speak at one of the microphones. Uh, that way, everyone will be able to hear. Hope you very much enjoy the conference. Thank you so much for being with us. And now, my honor to introduce Fred Oswald. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tony. Thanks to Moshe Vardy for uh, leading, coordinating this event. Thanks to the staff. Um, it's a real uh, privilege and, and pleasure to be able to present. We're about to see how uh, technology and mind come together as I try and pull up my presentation. Start my timer here, try to be on the mark. I think, Tony, you'll uh, warn me as needed, so, okay, um, presentation mode, yeah. Okay, all right, so um, how about we see a show of hands, um, literally a show of hands. Do you see a show of hands? <laughs> hey, hey, okay, keep your hands up. Um, please put your hand down if you have never taken a test before in your life, ever. Right. Oh, I'm going to be lapeled here. OK, you put your hands down, but I, I counted more than several here. Thank you. 
uh, reinforcing my uh, claim as I start out that uh, tests are ubiquitous. Uh, we take them uh, at every point in our life, starting at birth and um, well into adulthood. Um, and uh, I'll be focused in particular on testing in the employment context. Um, I'll largely avoid some of the philosophical is issues around um, why do we test, where do we test, those contextual issues are, are very important and I, I, I'm sure we, we all will connect the dots even in, in these very sessions around the broader ethical issues around AI and so on. Um, but I, I'll, I will touch on that and certainly my, my remarks will have bearing on that, but, but just to say there are broader issues around employment testing which is my uh, focus, my research focus, where I work in terms of applications in organizations and educational settings. Um, it's what I work with my graduate students on in the Organization and Workforce Lab, clever acronym, the OWL. And, um, uh, and so we, we focus on what tests um, look like, how do you develop tests, um, how do you make sure they do what you think they are doing, uh, but then again, there's this broader context, not just ethics, like I mentioned at a, at a really important and broad level, um, but also how tests connect to other uh, functions of organizations, such as those that I list here, recruiting, training, management, teamwork, promotion, right? Where does, how should selection play a role in that context um, where you know that there are other levers being pulled, right, to affect uh, what you want to do in an organization. But then there's also, a, a, of course, a broader system of education, right? Who even shows up at your door uh, to be uh, uh, recruited to, to be hired, right? And so a lot of our work also deals with the education to work pipeline and how skills um, are assessed in education, how they translate into work um, and so on. And there are vital conversations around that, uh, what education should or might look like in the future, um, particularly with new technologies and with people uh, reskilling after their traditional education. So that's some context issues for you. I'll give you some other context of what we do uh, in terms of testing by presenting you here what's called the, uh, well, you see the title, the ONET content model. The ONET is an occupational database uh, funded by the Department of Labor, maintained over, over many years, at least, at least 20. And um, it's designed to characterize uh, jobs in the US workforce. So there are about 1,000 or so job categories intended to represent US jobs more or less uh, comprehensively. And how it does so is represented by this model. So quantitative information gathered from uh, job analysts, people who know how to go into jobs and kind of categorize or, or uh, quantify what, what they're about. Um, also supervisors and job incumbents provide data into this occupational database. And so uh, you see the major axes in this content model. There's worker-oriented data, who are the workers, What's the situation like that's uh, you know, job oriented? So what's the environment like? Uh, is it hazardous? Is it technical? Um, those kinds of things. Um, and then the horizontal axis is more or less um, generic versus specific. So cross-cutting skills required across most jobs um, versus information unique to jobs. So that lays out uh, the types of areas we care about as organizational researchers um, but our focus on tests in particular um, may be uh, center on two categories, I would say, within this model. The first one is worker characteristics, where these are broader characteristics of people that um, where you, you may, you may have folks who don't have a lot of job experience, for example, and yet you need to know something about them. So you say, well, how do I measure your some general knowledge, you know, how do I measure your math and verbal skill? Um, how do I measure your conscientiousness? Maybe I want a conscientious worker, right? Uh, your ability to work in teams, your interpersonal skills, and so on. 
And if you were to put those measures in buckets, maybe there is a uh, technical bucket or um, a, uh, a knowledge bucket. Then there is a, um, an interpersonal bucket, right? You want workers to be interpersonally effective, not just have the knowledge, but know how to um, implement that knowledge in the workforce. And then a third bucket would be more intrapersonal type skills, like do you show up for work on time, and do you regulate your emotions, and how's your self-efficacy, and, and, and so on. And so um, those, are, those are the relative buckets where we develop me measures. Um, we've developed measures across those domains, so it's a have, test, will, travel kind of approach. Um, and I'll explain a little more about how, how that works um, in terms of uh, what makes for a good test. Um, then there are, I mentioned the, the, those kind of broader domains of, of characteristics where you don't have a lot of past experience from applicants, like entry level, right? You don't have a lot on your resume, so how's an employer going to know about you? And those are, those are the kind of broad areas I, I just outlined. Then here in the content model, we get to more specific worker requirements. So what kind of knowledge and education did you have? What kind of specific skills do you have? What kinds of things do you have under your belt that um, probabilistically, you know, maybe with no guarantee, but uh, strongly suggest you'd be ready to work on the job? So that's where more specific educational investments come in above and beyond general characteristics of, of who you are. Okay, but importantly, I want to make a point. Um, it is pretty obvious, and yet it must be made. Um, how job relevant characteristics are assessed is not the same thing as what is assessed. What I just described is what is assessed, right? Motivation and a personal skill, knowledge, et cetera. How you assess it is in a variety of formats, right? You can self report, whether that's on a standardized test, you're taking it yourself, filling out the bubbles, whether that's in an interview, you're declaring that you have these skills and they're being elicited from you through questions that may or may not be a structured interview, right? It could be an informal conversation, could be more standardized, these are the questions you ask of applicants, right? Um, resumes, right, they vary quite a bit. Reference letters, those could be structured or unstructured. Pe some people are good at writing reference letters, some people are, you know, it's, it's more nuanced than that, but, um, you know, people vary in their ability to write letters and and what you say as various meetings, right? Couldn't recommend him highly enough. <laughs> that has a double meaning, perhaps. Um, but the point is, um, these are methods, right? Methods are not the same as what you're trying to measure, the, the motivation, the job knowledge, the skill. So if somebody says to you, you know, do you think interviews are good tools? Are they reliable? Do they predict things in organizations? You have to say, like a professor would, it depends, right? It depends on what you're measuring. And um, of course, it depends on what you're predicting as well. Okay, so I wanna make that distinction important because it is important in the world of AI. So um, in my work, as I said, I've worked 23 years on developing tests um, in academia with my graduate students. And a lot of that work has been in a more traditional mode. Right, so there, there are decades of, 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 uh, of test development and uh, communities dedicated to ensuring there are good tests. Now AI comes in as a, uh, well, what, what, what is it? Uh, test vendors are saying that these traditional measures that were offered in the past now have this magic of AI. And um, honestly, sometimes we don't know what that is. Um, it, the brochure says AI. Um, there's a picture of a brain on the, on the pamphlet trying to sell you these tests. It claims that you will get better employees faster, et cetera. But what's behind it? And so, um, to their credit, many test vendors are measuring constructs. You know, they're measuring the things I just talked about. They're measuring, in the upper left, you see something that looks like reasoning ability. In the bottom left, a virtual, or an interview that you record for higher view um, seems to measure um, maybe interpersonal skills and, and other aspects. Um, virtual job tryout has benefits for knowing what you're getting yourself into. So the applicant 
can, uh, it's not just the, the company wanting to know about the applicant, it's the applicant learning about the company through virtual uh, uh, job exposure. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, and on the right side is uh, what's known as a situational judgment test where applicants respond to hypothetical situations about what they think would be effective or ineffective and, and those get scored. So all these types of tests are not new. Um, what is new is how those tests are potentially delivered. So for example, the technology where the interview gets recorded, it's not necessarily in person. You could maybe re-record or you could even um, you know, get on an AI platform and be trained for doing the virtual interview that you eventually take. Like it's a whole new world of, of interviewing. Um, so the technology is new, the data are new potentially, so you're not just responding to a traditional test, you're, they're looking at mouse clicks and how long your mouse is dwelling in a certain place or, or even vocal intonation in the interview is still being um, considered. Um, some of the facial recognition folks have backed away from, you may have seen in the news, but um, there are still kind of these types of data that were not that are not in the traditional mode, uh, you know, uh, uh, fill out the bubble sheet one to five scale. It's well more than that when you're collecting data through a technology. Um, so the technology, the data, then there are the algorithms, machine learning algorithms, right? We've heard of neural nets or and so on. Um, and finally, the decisions that are being made. All of these are, there are new aspects to each of these in terms of AI, right? And um, it's important to keep them separate, I guess would be one point, you know, as a discerning consumer of these tools to understand that these parts are, are different and you might want to understand what they mean if you care about whether they're, they're doing anything. Um, this is not to uh, say that traditional tests have, don't have the same similar questions, right? Um, you all have taken tests all the time, right? And do we question whether which items are reliable or whether they uh, predict your future knowledge that you'll apply in the real world, well, you decide. Um, often it's not true. Um, AI vendors will often say that their tests, in the employment arena, will often say their tests are unbiased. I'm gonna shock you and suggest that a coin flip is also unbiased. Um, so how do you know that an AI testing tool is giving you something more than a coin flip. If, you, if a company is paying a good deal of money for an AI test, as they might with a brain on the pamphlet, that might cost you. Um, are they doing something more than a coin flip? And that's not to say that all fair tests are coin flips. I don't mean to say that in the least. All I'm saying is that if you say that your test is fair as an AI vendor, you, you, you need to provide some information about how, right? How is it fair beyond coin flip? So for example, um, coin flips um, are, are not reliable, right? You could get a head or a tail either way. You know that. I wanted to pause for some awkward laughter. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, in a test, you hope a test is not like a coin flip, right? It reflects the knowledge that you have gained. Um, my, uh, my students in my class, when I suggest, well, why don't I just give you a one, one item test? Um, it'd be easy to score, um, easy to give, that'd be done. All of a sudden, they become measurement experts. They're like, well, I've learned a lot, and I want you to understand that you need to sample items from everything I've, I've learned, and um, you know, basically get at a fair assessment of what, uh, what they're doing. So coin flip's not reliable. Coin flip's not valid. It's not gonna predict things in the world. And we want reliability in tests. We want the job applicant who comes in at a certain point in time and take a test, more or less they're the same job applicant if they came in, if they happen to come in three days later and take the test, you wouldn't want an entirely different person, right? Um, at least, I mean, they might be in some ways, but in terms of the types of things you wanna measure in a job applicant, they're relatively stable pending uh, meaningful job-related changes. That, that's what you want. So coin flips, they're, uh, they're affordable. They might be fair if you think uh, unbiased uh, flip coin flips are fair. Uh, they would make quick HR decisions, right? Um, so uh, that gets touted in AI. 
they make quick decisions, um, you know, and they're unbiased, but we need to learn more. Uh, they're fun and engaging also, right? Games are fun. Those are the things you did to, uh, when you skipped school. Uh, tests are not fun. Uh, those were the things you were avoiding, <laughs> right? So, so in some sense, AI games are being sold as, you know, when you took a test as a job applicant, that was noxious and uh, not as fun as uh, AI. The point is, what else are you getting out of it? Okay, and we have to be careful about our language um, when we are talking about AI, but when we're talking about testing in general, and that's because there's a lot of different terminology flying around. Again, to keep the, it's important to keep these things distinct. And it's not to say that we'll ever develop together a universal terminology. It's simply to say that um, keep the ideas straight in your head when you see different things that might go by the same label. So for example, a bias test, right? Bias can mean a lot of different things. Um, in the, in, the, in the machine learning literature, bias means something mathematical, right? So like if you had a machine learning algorithm that had a uh, regression basis, for example, if y'all are familiar with using uh, linear regression, the idea is that um, maybe I can tweak the regression parameters, the, the values that are used for prediction. Maybe I tweak them a little bit so that I'm not right basically trying to explain this in a, in a kind of layperson way. Um, I'm not right on average necessarily, but I am more right overall. I'm reducing the noise. So on average, I might be a little bit off, but I want to be a little bit off. I want to be biased in order to reduce some of the noise, right? And so that's done a lot in machine learning in terms of tuning these, these algorithms. So bias is not a bad thing in that sort of modeling endeavor. So that's, um, that's a different way of thinking about bias. Uh, uh, another way to think about bias is perhaps a way we, we tend to think about in employment testing. So on the right side, if we think about two groups that are applying for a job, and one group tends to score higher than another, as you see in the chart there, there's a lot of overlap, right? So the lower group, you have lots of people scoring above the higher group, but on average, the means are separate. Well then, folks in the higher group are gonna get, as the gray shading indicates, more folks in the blue group are getting selected than in the red group. And that's viewed as a, a biased test. And if that separation is large enough, um, in the employment literature, it triggers a, a Title VII case, a prima facie case for adverse impact, meaning you need to investigate if those differences get large enough. It doesn't mean you did something biased as an employer, but it does, uh, it's an outcome focus that suggests you need to look and see, look into the process more to see if something is going on there in a, in a way that is, we're selecting on job irrelevant characteristics that are uh, related to uh, these subgroups. So it doesn't mean you did something uh, in terms of bias, right? There, there, there are often differences in data, but it, when differences get large enough, then you start investigating and the EEOC has rules, uh, some rules for that. So, um, yeah, so in the AI world, my argument would be that we still need to look at issues. This isn't my argument. This, I think anybody would argue, is that you still need to look at test design, you need to look at the fairness of tests, whether they're reliable, and what they predict in the world. You can have a reliable test. It kind of looks like it should measure you know, someone tells you it measures conscientiousness, you take it, it kind of looks like it measures conscientiousness. Well, that's a good first step. But um, what do statistics do to inform those feelings um, about being reliable? Um, you know, do the items more or less measure the same thing? Are they stable, relatively stable over time? Do they predict outcomes that we care about? in the real world that are in control of the, in this case, the job applicant, right? As opposed to uh, situational factors. That, these are tough things, um, but that's why my grad students will be employed once they graduate, is uh, we're, we're constantly uh, investigating these issues. So I'm very happy for them. Um, so Mark Twain was attributed as saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And when I give you these statements, it's to make that point. It's to say that these terms, 
don't go away. Uh, reliability, validity, fairness, test design, they don't go away. Perhaps they become even more important as we have this other terminology and these other kinds of approaches um, coming into the conversation around tests. We need to remember our standards and principles. Literally, <laughs> standards are on the left, principles are on the right. So uh, the standards for educational and psychological testing uh, has been a, a go-to uh, for professional guidelines on test development for decades. Uh, likewise, the principles for validation and use of personnel selection procedures, that's more focused, as the title says, on, on hiring issues, but contains similar um, uh, issues as the standards in terms of reliability and validity. It's just contextualized in the employment setting. Both are um, serious go-to documents in the employment setting. Um, they provide important context around um, the issues of uh, legality, um, ethics, and, and science. It reflects uh, the cumulative research that seems to have held around test development. What do we know, basically? You would want to go to these these documents to find out what we know and what we don't know. Okay, so Measurement 101 says that um, when you want to develop a measure, you, you, you want to get in that center part of the Venn diagram, right? So the red circle reflects what you're trying to measure, a construct like conscientiousness. I'll hang on to that example. And the pink circle reflects what your measure actually does. Right, so the pink circle, you would love for it to overlap the red circle entirely, right? What you see is what you get, you're, you're just spot on. Well, you're gonna measure some conscientiousness, hopefully a great deal of it, and so the relevant part is in the middle. But you might not measure all of it, right? And so um, to the extent you have that crescent on the left, your measure is deficient. There's some stuff you're not measuring. And that's a difficult thing to see because you can't see it. It's not on the page, right? So if I ask you, you know, do you show up for meetings on time, and I ask you that five times in a row, shocking, um, it would be reliable. It might even predict outcomes, right? But does that item, asked five times in a row, actually measure conscientiousness as you think of it as a broad construct? Probably not, right? You need to sample from a broader universe to get at different aspects of you know, making goals and following through with them or attending to details, right? Other aspects of conscientiousness that, that matter. Inevitably, your measure will be, have some deficiencies. No measure is perfect, right? We don't do rocket science here. I'll be the first to admit to that. Even though we're applying AI to it, um, it's, uh, you know, we're always trying to create the best measures through our conceptual approach, right? Trying to measure the red circle as much as possible, and then through statistics that help us uh, quantitatively evaluate whether what we think is good is turning out to be good. So that's an iterative cycle. And then our items have inevitable contamination. There are things in our items we don't want to measure, right? So we have to work hard on that as well. That can be random errors. Um, where it's not the fault of the item, you just happen to get tired, you woke up and you kept taking items and you know, that kind of fluctuation. Uh, it could be you know, something is misread. It could be that the item itself is just poorly worded and some people kind of read through and understand what you meant to say and other folks are confused and respond in a confused way. So that's a form of contamination and so there are statistical methods for trying to get it at these aspects, but like I said, it's a conceptual one as well. And consider the AI analogs, right? That um, when you're measuring all, um, all kinds of things in an AI assessment, like, a, like in a game, um, what parts of it are job relevant and what parts of it might be contaminated? And getting at the more traditional notion of bias, right? What, what aspects are bias against subgroups, bias against people, right? What makes for the principles of what makes for a good measure, um, again, I'll say it again, doesn't go away. It gets maybe stronger in this new AI era for developing measures. Um, so I'll give you one example of kind of the two circles, and this was a paper we did where we, um, 
we looked at job postings um, or descriptions of jobs in the ONET, which I just shared with you. So they were verbal descriptions, and we applied natural language processing to extract themes from them. And basically the idea is um, each column here, these aren't all the things we found, but each column here is a theme we found in the, in the job descriptions, and then each word below um, is reflective of the theme. So cognitive is like knowledge, and um, you'll see the words below um, reflect scientific type research, research involving analysis, uh, design. We, we could have called the we could have called the column maybe maybe more scientifically oriented work, uh, investigative work is what an interest researcher would call it. Um, the second column is more perceptual physical, so transportation is there in strong. A strong suit there as you look top to bottom, um, dealing with vehicles, dealing with law. So the point is, um, we, we took those themes and then related the, the verbal description of the jobs to the quantitative information within the database. And we found, partningly, uh, relationships, right? So when a job description uh, contained um, requirements in a verbal sense, and we extract these themes, they actually related to the ratings of whether the, the, those uh, characteristics were relevant for the job. And I know what you're thinking, so what? Um, and that was our, uh, we thought about that as well in our research that um, it's important to know that you have this convergence, not just convergence, but that your, your descriptions are not so generic, they apply to other jobs as well. So you have a discrimination effect as well in the uh, lay sense of that word, right? You, you, you detect similarities in terms of convergence, but then there are also differences as well that uh, the language serves to uh, create. So that's good, and they align with the data, and that's good. Um, but there is a question sort of related to the circles, but at a more macro level is, um, Maybe, maybe there are parts of the job description that could be made better because you learn more about the quantitative information, right? Or maybe uh, the quantitative information could be enhanced because of the uh, verbal descriptions that you found. And so actually, the parts that don't correlate with each other, the uniquenesses, might lead to enhance the database, enhance the ONET, but also enhanced job descriptions. And so, um, you know, maybe chat GPT will help uh, create better uh, uh, job descriptions, but, um, you know, these sorts of relationships we found could be sort of the starter, like sourdough, to um, iterate and create better job descriptions and create better, better data. So, for what it's worth, this was our machine learning attempt at getting at are we measuring job relevant characteristics like you saw in the, in the Venn diagram? This is the only math you'll see pretty much, um, just real quick, is um, what I wanted to point out is how in developing a measure, um, the, right, you take a multi-item test, it's supposed to measure some domain of, uh, of learning or of, of personality and motivation. They're all sort of in the same family of whatever you're trying to measure, right? And if that's true, then the items will um, correlate, right? If you tended to respond on the high end to one item, you'll tend to respond on the high end to another item. Same thing for low, right? And to the extent that's true, you'll, you'll see those relationships in the off diagonal, okay? So I use the word glue, and it is glue. Um, we use linear models in traditional measurement, um, but basically there's a number in, the, in those off diagonals that's a positive number that reflects glue uh, between the items. Um, the diagonal reflects the uniqueness of the item, called the variance, right? So, so it's, it's just what's unique about the item. And the point I want to make is a pretty simple one, um, is that the uniquenesses of the item, you see how they're on the diagonal, right? So seven items, you have seven unique pieces. Um, the glue, you have a lot more glue than just seven pieces, right? So as you add items to a composite, as a seven items of conscientiousness, as you ask those items, you're building up that glue. Do you see that? You're, the, the number of things in the off diagonal just gets bigger and bigger and swaps the uniquenesses on the diagonal. 
right? So the theme is really emerging. And when we talk about signal versus noise in the big data world, the signal is the relationship between the items coming through. So as long as you ask a bunch of items that reflect a common theme, you'll see this phenomenon happening. And that's important um, in traditional tests, right? You want all the items to measure more or less the same thing. In the AI world, well, um, you could do this. You could say, well, let's group these things together and, and see if there's something there there. So, you know, machine learning in terms of clustering or dimension reduction, you might say, oh, these all belong. We'll, we'll label this a certain thing. We're amplifying the signal in this way, right? So there's an analog there between traditional measurement, what we call psychometrics in uh, organizational and educational research, and then machine learning where these may not be linear relationships, right? But there's still signal building up between uh, like items. And by the way, you know, in machine learning, again, if you're doing mouse clicks and you're relating them all, are those all job relevant if I'm doing employment testing? I'll let the pause uh, kind of hang in the room there. But once we know we're measuring something, um, we can start, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but. Um, you know, we can start looking in traditional modeling, we start looking at whether um, constructs like conscientiousness and job knowledge, let's say those are F1 and F2. I know that looks like a, I don't know what that looks like, a spider. Um, conscientiousness and job knowledge. So you can look at it in one group and you can look at it in another group. So um, men and women, um, subgroups by race, ethnicity. You could look at age, older, younger. And basically the idea here, even putting all these statistics aside, is, is do, the, do the pipes flow in the same way? Does the, does the test behave in a similar manner across groups? Are there items that uh, kind of stand out as being different between groups? And again, there's an interplay between conceptual and statistical. So you'll look at these lambdas and say, hey, they're different between groups. We should revise the item or delete the item and so on. There's also conceptual, right? So there are often uh, sensitivity review committees that'll look at items and make sure they're, they're culturally sensitive. They're sensitive to the developmental stage of the group. Say you have kids that are taking uh, occupational interest tests. You wanna make sure they can read them and understand what's being asked. So all that conceptual work's important in addition to the statistical work. And all that is taken very seriously in the educational and occupational types of literatures. And I'll say, um, you know, I, I don't know the vast expanse of machine learning, even within occupational applications, but I will say that um, I think what has been done here in a more traditional sense can inform what is being done in machine learning sense, because we're, we're basically trying to tease apart the signal and the noise, like I was showing you in the glue diagram. This is also, the glue are the F1 and F2, the, that's the glue. That's the covariance between the items, which are the boxes below, right? So um, I guess I should have said that earlier, right? Um, the boxes below are items, and um, the, 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 the top, F1 and F2, that reflects what they have in common. Um, and so uh, I think in, in this psychometric modeling, uh, the machine learners could gain insights, and vice versa. Um, we all need to keep our ears open. How are machine learners trying to extract um, job relevance from big data uh, is super important. Okay, so that's, um, oops. So that was looking at measures. Are they measuring the same thing between groups? But you could also look at prediction between groups, right? So if you're looking at, um, here we have uh, race ethnicity, you're looking at whether prediction is the same between groups within, say, an organization or a school. You could say, does conscientiousness predict performance? Well, yeah, there's a positive relationship. But that positive relationship uh, could be different between groups, or on the right, we see one group has zero relationship. Um, and so we pay, as researchers, we pay great attention to this as well. It's called differential prediction. So previous slide is the measure the same or different across groups. This slide is prediction the same or different across groups. And those are important questions, but let me add that they, um, they're not directly related to the issue of whether um, two groups differ on a measure um, in the end. Like at the beginning when I showed you how 
two groups were separated by the means and they have mean differences. Well, do they have mean differences because they perceive the measure differently? Well, you don't know just by looking at the outcome, right? Um, do they predict differently uh, in terms of, um, if I'm selecting on conscientiousness and two groups show mean differences, do they predict performance differently for the groups? You don't know, just all you know is they were selected differently. You don't know how it would predict performance, right? So these issues about the equivalence of measures and equivalence of prediction, they're important to investigate, but they're, they go beyond any Title VII issue with EEOC and hiring disparities. This gets into why there might be uh, types of disparities in terms of what, how the applicants are understanding what's being measured and uh, whether those measures even do anything in the real world for, for some groups and not others or, or for all groups. So this is kind of the world in which uh, measurement operates and machine learning can, can do a lot in this, in this vein. So um, this slide is simply to say what level is appropriate for machine learning. So I mentioned how we might try as researchers to get at these factors, right? The, the conscientiousness predicts performance. There are various measures of conscientiousness, for example, and then there might be specific items at the very bottom here. In machine, in, in, as a psychologist, um, I'm often looking at up here, conscientiousness predicting performance, because we're trying to get at job relevance that items share in common. So we're getting at themes. And so we're looking at relationships at this broad level. In the machine learning literature, you might look at any of these levels. So let's look at the bottom. In the bottom, you might say, does this collection of items relate to, uh, that pertain to conscientiousness, does that relate to this collection of items that relate to performance? And because if you go down here, you're capturing the uniquenesses of the items. You're capturing that diagonal and that square I showed you. Um, your prediction might get bigger, right, if you go down here. The problem is we hear about machine learning and black box of uh, not being interpretable, is that items contain things that are job relevant and also things that are not relevant, as I showed you with the red circles, right? And so even if you got prediction down here that was better than prediction up here, you might be giving up some interpretability in the service of prediction. Right, so I found more prediction because I, I, gave, I gave prediction more of a chance down here, but it may not be due to psychological characteristics. And you might say, well, so what? I'm not a psychologist, I don't care. Um, well, you're, you're right, but even if it's not psychologically based, you need to know why, because there are good things like job relevance and there are bad things like bias that can be hiding at the item level. Right, and that's where we're having all these conversations around machine learning is what is in there, right? What is in there? And so as a measurement approach, we try to extract what is in there in terms of the psychological themes that matter, in terms of how items are related to each other conceptually, but then also through data, data gathering correlation. So we're operating at this higher level to get at interpretability and prediction. Um, so we don't apologize necessarily when prediction is lower, uh, when a machine learning approach finds greater prediction, because we can say, well, we know what we're predicting. And, and it is worth, it's not an either or situation. You can look at both. You can say, hey, when you modeled it as factors at this higher level, conscientiousness predicting performance, you got this amount of prediction, I understand it. What's the difference? How much more prediction did you get when you looked at the item level? And if it's huge, you might want to, plumb that further, right, and get at uh, maybe more uh, empirical treasure, uh, more, more prediction. But that's sort of the interplay I think is appropriate for looking at traditional psychological measurement with, with machine learning. Oops. Oh, I spelled prediction with two eyes. Thanks for noticing. I appreciate that. Um, okay, I think I'll skip this. That, that's just saying like, you know, machine learning is not transparent, right? We have these algorithms like random forest where um, there's co complications of um, each tree makes separate predictions and um, you average those predictions to try and get it a better overall prediction, but do you know what all those trees mean? 
well, it's not as interpretable as like how items related to conscientiousness, how items related to performance. This is much more complex as guess I would say. I could just as well have put up a neural net or support vector machine or things like that. Um, and machine learning is a journey. It's not a um, one stop kind of thing. You can process data to get a Dorito of knowledge um, and you can then apply traditional methods to say, hey, I gained knowledge from machine learning that I wouldn't have gotten before. I can iterate and go back and collect more data in a, maybe in a more traditional vein where you're, you're amplifying the signal with more traditional items. Hey, some things came out of gamification. I learned something. Well, I, I have a psychological interpretation for what people are clicking on. I can develop a more psychological measure like if they were clicking because they were attending to detail and that reflected conscientiousness, maybe you could extract or play with that a little bit and get more than you would have gotten in a traditional notion. So there's an iterative approach to measure development that works. Um, how am I doing on time? Two minutes. Okay, so uh, one thing I'll say is that um, Audits are, are in, the, in the air when it comes to employment testing. It's important to audit algorithms. So uh, Pymetrics here is just one out of many examples um, where they published, uh, to their credit, um, an evaluation of their algorithms about whether it was fair or not, right? So they, they find fairness in their measures. But they, they don't investigate the measures in their audit. So this is what I say on the right. They, they, they are fair and, and um, to their credit, point out what they didn't investigate. But what they say is they don't investigate whether the measures measure human capabilities, whether they map to job performance, whether other measures would be superior in some respect. And so um, they don't comment on rationality and ethics. So all these things clearly matter, and AI assessments need to incorporate a broader range, and again, not just the fairness issue, right? Why is it fair in terms of similar measurements, similar prediction, and does it predict outcomes that matter? There are federal policies at play that uh, attempt to speak at these issues, and much more AI competitiveness uh, in the US, um, leadership on the international platform, trustworthy AI well beyond employment testing. So those, those policies are underway. They're early in the process, I would say, just like all of us in our understanding of AI. There's an executive order. Um, that has federal agencies, uh, 13960, that has agencies uh, basically report everything they're doing that's AI relevant, and many agencies have yet to kind of comply. Part of it is what is AI, and part of it is what, what, what parts of those AI technologies do you want us to report? So, so they're trying to figure that out um, in terms of AI policy. Um, there, there, there's also, uh, uh, 14058, I don't know why I'm citing all these numbers, uh, but, but that deals with um, a customer service approach to AI in the federal government, making sure we trust AI, that it's transparent and useful, and uh, so, so there's clear national imperatives from the top down to make AI more successful in the world, more, more useful, balancing innovation with regulation, um, and that's true at the state level for AI-based specific uh, uh, to personnel uh, selection. Uh, the New York uh, uh, Automated uh, Employment Decision Tools Law is gonna be enacted next year. Um, tons of people got on a Zoom call, including myself, to comment on it. We broke their Zoom, basically, to talk about the issues that um, need to be considered when it comes to reporting uh, whether uh, hiring tools in New York are complying with the law. Um, so a lot of action is happening. We need more use cases of AI in selection. I think we learn from actual uses because of the earlier distinctions I pointed out between data, technology, algorithms, and, and decisions that are ultimately made. We need to see how that works in the world. We need more use cases. So hopefully if um, um, my, my future presentations, your future presentations, if you're interested in this work, um, we'll get at uh, you know, how are the data and AI technologies being job relevant, which data are indirect, like text mining resumes and mouse clicks that may or may not provide use, and which ones are irrelevant but maybe predictive, like love of curly fries. I'll, I'll leave you with those uh, to whet your appetite for the next talk. But uh, what, what do you do with 
when you find prediction that is not job relevant and, uh, and not illegal. It's not illegal to select on love of curly fries. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. So, Fred, much of the um, machine learning uh, techniques are based on huge training sets. And we all know what the biases are in the selection of those training sets. So, for example, ending up with your curly fries, I mean, maybe that's a predictor, but it's going to be emitted in many of the training sets. Uh, but likewise, so will specialized populations that we might be very interested in. Uh, so the subpopulations may get ignored by the, uh, by the construction of the training sets. Do you have any, do you think the solution is just, let's open everything up to as much data as possible and ignore training sets? Or should we be maybe a little more, um, have a little more perspective on the way we assemble those training sets for the purposes that we have in mind? Yeah, thanks Rick, a really interesting question. So. Developing training sets in the, in the selection context is a real challenge. You certainly have these uh, general issues about uh, relevant subgroups being included in the training set. Um, you also have a selection specific challenge where if you're using the model to predict job performance, you only have the people that were hired um, to look at that relationship between the applicant tests and performance. You don't have the full sample of applicants. So if what you were selecting on is uh, correlated with um, you know, the AI measure, then you're only getting a limited sample in that respect. And how do you correct for that fact? In, in traditional linear models, you can make attempts. But in machine learning, where you're mining for the actual underlying functional form, you can't. Um, and so uh, I think that it, that's a very uh, special challenge. There's also an issue of balancing, and I, you know, I'm, I'm really raising more issues than answering questions, is um, how you could use a uh, machine, you could, you could use a tuned, a trained algorithm on data you're, you're more or less happy with in terms of providing, um, let's just use a blanket for it, you know, powerful prediction. It looks like it works. Um, but it's not recognizing the local situation necessarily. So if, if it's, if it looks like a great diverse training set, but it's, let's say it cuts across industries. So you like the sample, but it's not your industry and it's all mixed up and how do you, maybe you can't tease it apart because it's just an object you're allowed to use. How do you balance that with prediction you can make in the local setting with different data? I think those balancing acts are really important. Of course, you can get over sample subgroups. Um, you can, uh, you, you know, you have to be mindful of not just the, the sample of people, but the sample of, data, sample of items or, or the AI equivalent, you know, the mouse clicks and so on. It, one thing about the machine learning kind of setting is it's opened our thinking up to different dimensions of designing a, uh, a study for looking, in this case, at selection. So like, you know, in traditional testing, we certainly have thought about our samples as well, but maybe not with the uh, uh, representation that we think about in machine learning context, right? Or the cross-validation issue. Virtually nobody has uh, paid attention to out-of-sample prediction in traditional selection. And so it's great we're opening our eyes to these questions. And if I didn't answer your question, I, I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> is yes. This, is this on? Yes. Uh, well, first, uh, I'm glad I'm, I'm not in the job market. I don't want to be interviewed <laughs> by. So, a question: um, Can you comment on the uh, how pervasive is the use of AI in interviewing in industry, or also in uh, government uh, entities? And there have been any legal challenges? to AI applications in the interview process? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the law around AI and selection is uh, ongoing. We see laws creep up um, 
and are they being challenged? They're, they're starting to. So one example, and I'm not sure of case law around this, but one example would be um, HireVue is a company that has made uh, the news for the fact that they were looking at uh, uh, facial expressions using AI or facial um, movement with AI and so on. And so issues of bias and relevancy came up quite quickly, and they've pulled away from uh, applying that in their virtual interviews. Um, I believe they're still using things like vocal intonation and things like that, which has, I would believe, its own problems in terms of job relevance. I, I might be wrong. These things are very quickly evolving. Um, as I said, in the federal government, as, as you pointed out, um, there's a, there is a push there through these executive orders to um, really be critical consumers of what AI is and hopefully set examples for what can be done in businesses, uh, perhaps as models that are not regulated, but perhaps aspects of it will be regulated. So it's a quickly moving kind of, kind of landscape. Um, I, I can't say I have definitive case law that has set wheels in motion uh, on uh, some of these important issues about ensuring reliable and valid tests. Although I will say there, there, there are laws that um, require, like the Illinois law requires uh, consent uh, to the use of, uh, of AI-based uh, selection. So the, the applicant has to know that it's being used, like these virtual interviews that I mentioned. Um, the New York law is going to be pretty interesting to see if uh, any case law comes from that. Right now, it looks more or less like an EO1 kind of reporting requirement, like you just report the differences in hiring rates between subgroups, which is a pretty standard uh, kinds of data you give to, to EO. Um, but the, the additional uh, uh, point from the New York law is to say you, you have to do, you have to provide this to the state if you're doing something that Im involves uh, automated uh, employment decisions. And so there's, there's very vigorous conversation around what is an automated employment decision. So if an AI tool measure um, produces scores for an employer, and, and uh, let's say it pr also produces uh, red, yellow, green, like don't hire, maybe hire, definitely hire. Um, okay, the, the vendor didn't tell you to follow that, but if, you're, if what you actually did corresponds almost perfectly with those decisions, then I think you could say that the, the vendor is giving an automated decision to the, I mean, and in fact, isn't that what organizations want? They want something that's easier. And so I think there will be some conversation, some, if not case law, some serious conversations around what's the boundary between autonomy of uh, choice in hiring and what the algorithms are doing. So stay tuned. Yeah, Margaret. Hi, Fred. Just oh. one more. Can I? Okay. Hi, Fred. Um, thank you for making testing so interesting. Um, oh. I really appreciate it. So um, one question I had is about the research that's going on in this area. So in traditional assessment and testing, that's been going on in psychology for 120 years since Binet's intelligence assessments. But how about in AI? I mean, that's the thing that will inform some of the litigation will be the research that's going on in AI and how valid and reliable it is? Yeah, that's great. A great question, Margaret. Um, the examples keep coming in. So I, I have, I've been hoarding articles. Um, if you, I, I might be on the show Hoarders uh, sometime soon with articles about machine learning and uh, personnel selection. It used to be relatively empty and, you know, an article would drift in every month or so. Now I'm seeing four or five articles, you know, in a month easily around um, machine learning in the employment interview, uh, machine learning and bio data, which is short for biographical data. What kind of information can we learn from people, like resume information that is relevant to work? Um, can uh, web scrapers accurately get this information? And don't forget the information, again, the red circles, don't forget what you can't see, the people that are not providing information on the resume that's still relevant, the machine learning algorithm's not gonna pick up on that. And maybe, maybe you can make some predictions for machine learning about whether somebody, what type of person someone is, even based on what they didn't provide, that's another conversation. But how do you make, how do you make more structure in a world that 
could be potentially largely, ooh, largely unstructured in the machine learning environment. So we're getting our, um, our hands dirty, our feet wet um, in all this space, uh, which is very promising. Um, so that, um, and I'm an organizational researcher, like I said, an organizational psychologist. Um, I'm seeing more interaction with computer science communities uh, that have been more deeply engaged, which is great for everyone, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.